peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the Christian faith is built on a paradox in that God is one and He is three. And those three persons, capital P, are distinct. Yet they share one divine essence. Those three persons are very Different, yet we confess God as one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yes, you get into it. It's a it's a bit of a mind bender, no doubt. And though this confession is made here numerous times, every time we gather, really, especially on the Lord's Day, but today we place special emphasis upon it. So let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, the Athanasian Creed gives us a thorough explanation of the Trinity, but even though we did it a little bit different today in the sense of we didn't just recite the entire thing through, but there was a back and forth response, it still falls a little flat. It was compiled in response to errors that had crept into the church. It's very interesting, about a month ago I started to read church fathers and really spend most of my reading time, especially in the morning, just on the church fathers. And there are church fathers who were in existence, well, not in existence, but they were operating as pastors and bishops. And this is before the Athanasian Creed was written, before the Nicene Creed actually uh, was written as well. My point is, is that you will read through these fathers and you'll see many of the lines that we just read together. Was it like somebody came together with a, a blank page to write the Athanasian Creed? They, they took writings from this guy over here and writings from this church father and they put it all together in this creed. Because errors had crept in. And it's easy for us as fallen human beings to try to explain who God is and what God is like, even though He tells us it is so far beyond you. I don't know if this is a right comparison, but it's kind of like, I don't know, an ant trying to explain what? A, a Boeing 747? I mean, even that is limited. We're talking about an unlimited God. And we, of course, are limited. One of the errors that had crept in the church was the fact that in the Old Testament, it's like God wore different hats. Or he, he, he operated in different modes. This is actually called modalism. In the Old Testament, God wore the God the Father hat. And then he took that hat off, that mode. And then he put on God the Son hat throughout the Gospels. And then at the coming of Pentecost, he took that hat off and he put on the God, the Holy Spirit hat. Now, does that make sense rationally? That God was like this and then God became this and then God was like this? Yeah, yeah. That makes so much sense. What's the problem? <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. Not true at all. By the way, guess who believes that? You ever heard of T.D. Jakes? 
He's a modalist. Believes God operated one way in the past, and he operated another way in the Gospels, and then he operates another way now today. So again, these creeds are very important. Errors rise up. They were creeping into the church. People were believing. Hey, did you hear about this? Oh, I heard this. Hey, I read this book. The church comes along and says, man, we we got we to gotta, we gotta have a standardized way of saying and believing uh, certain things. And so it's trying to, the church was trying to make sense of God, but unfortunately with these errors, they were using their own ideas rather than doing what? Accepting what the scriptures reveal about God. So the creed, again, as I say, was to confront the false teachings. But when you come to the end of it, there's two thoughts that emerge. First, humankind would never invent a God like this, ever. And the second one is, you just got to sit there. The Holy Trinity is ultimately a mystery. However, just because we come upon a mystery doesn't mean that we throw Christianity out with the bathwater. For example, there are quite a number of mysteries concerning God, things that don't make total sense to us. I mean, can you explain, this is what I said in our adult Bible class this morning, can you truly explain the incarnation? How true God becomes true man? I mean, I can say some nice things, I can quote some scripture verses, but at the end of that, I, I can't fully explain it. I believe it. I confess it. But fully explain it? It's a mystery. What about how Christ's death satisfies the full wrath of the Almighty God? Or that how the blood which flows from Jesus' pierced side has made atonement for every last one of your sins. Including the sins of the whole world. And if that weren't enough, this same blood flows into the chalice for you. For the forgiveness of all of your sins. Talk about a mystery. What about the water that flows from Jesus' pure side and how that water flows into the baptismal font, making baptism a true washing away of sin? You know, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Don't hold me to this. Is this being recorded? Oh, okay. Maybe we'll edit it out. This is probably why our non-Lutheran friends, who are Christians have such a hard time with baptism and the Lord's Supper because at the end of the day it's a what? It's a mystery. And they want it very rational. So the Lord's Supper, the whole, the whole idea of the sacrament of the altar is to do what? To remember. Remember. Do this in remembrance of me. Just remember. What about baptism? Oh, that just ends. That's just, that's just symbolic just means you're on Team Jesus. Yay, Team Jesus! You had that? No, you probably won't. See, God connects promises to things that we can see and we can touch and we can taste. And just because we fully can't understand or adequately explain, that doesn't mean that we throw it out. There are some things we simply believe by faith. And the Holy Trinity is one of them. Now, it shouldn't surprise any of us that God's being is magnificent, that He is incomprehensible beyond our understanding. And that was referred to in our epistle reading. Understanding all there is to know about God, folks, that is above my pay grade. But what we can understand is that God is for you, not just one time in one person, not just two times in two persons, but get this, God is for you three times, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you've ever been around Jehovah's Witnesses, they love to tell people that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. But what they fail to realize is that God's triune nature is replete in Scripture. What did the seraphim say? What? Holy, 
holy, holy. You see it there. This is what they said at this altar. Notice they didn't say holy, 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 holy. They didn't say holy, holy. They said it thrice times. It's everywhere in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 6.4. The word in Hebrew for here is Shema. And so the great Shema of Hebrew 6.4 is Hear, Shema, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That cuts against all of the pagans with their countless gods. And so we start there. God is one. One, yet the Son prays to the Father, so the Son is distinct from the Father, and the Father is distinct from the Son. The Father and the Son send out the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son. And then, of course, a prominent text on the Trinity is Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have told you. Then there's our gospel reading this morning where Nicodemus is struggling with the notion of being born. We say born again, but it's born from above. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, talks about how he came from God, the Father. And he also talks about the Holy Spirit who causes us to be born from above. Three persons in one passage all of which are referred to as God. See, the word Trinity is just a shorthand for this. It's just shorthand. Where's the Trinity in the Bible? Uh, times the race start? Six? We could probably get out of here before six looking at all these places. There's 1 Corinthians 13. One of the various benedictions that we use in our liturgy, it reads, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We add all of these verses together. And again, there's so many. We add all of them to see that God is one, yet there are three, three distinct persons. Speaking of NASCAR, it reminds me how I was invited to enjoy one of those NASCAR truck races out in Kansas at the Kansas Motor Speedway uh, about three or four years ago. Obviously, being from North Carolina, NASCAR uh, was, was something wonderful to go and see. I did it with my dad as a boy growing up, and so I felt right at home out there. I was with another pastor friend of mine. We got there in plenty of time. We situated ourselves in our seats, eventually rising, of course, for the national anthem and the opening prayer. Prayer was offered for the usual safety of the drivers, for the Lord to hold off the rain. Thanksgivings then were made for all the hard work that the boys do down in the shop. And then for the dedicated fans who filled the seats. To conclude, the man who was praying, I didn't, I didn't catch his name, he says this, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. It was like an involuntary reflex for me. The pastor friend and I turned to one another and we looked at each other at the exact same time and we said, whose name? Whose name? Exactly in whose name are we praying? I mean, it was never specified. It could have been whoever we wanted it to be. To which you say, oh, come on, pastor. Don't you know that when somebody prays in your name, they're all talking about the same triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, if you say so. But what's wrong with beginning your prayers, ending them as well, but beginning them in the name of the Father and of the Son? and of the Holy Spirit. What's wrong with beginning your day making the sign of the cross saying in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? I mean, this is how we start our service. Why wouldn't you start your day that way? Why wouldn't you start your prayers that way? I mean, what's wrong with even ending your day in the exact same way as you put your head upon the pillow and you say in the name of the Father and the Son? and the Holy Spirit, the name that He's given you. 
my admonition to you is use His most holy name, but do so reverently. Use this name that He's placed on you, upon your forehead and upon your heart as a sinner at your baptism, doing so by means of the Holy Spirit and baptismal waters. I mean, that's just what it means to be born from above, just as Jesus told Nicodemus. Beloved, there's no richer crown than God's own holy name. A crown that He has placed on your forehead. We do not believe nor worship a generic, benign, supreme being. We believe in one God, the Father who has created and sustained your life, and yet He is the one who knows your sin and put into place a way of salvation for you. We believe in the Son who fulfilled the Father's plan, dying on the cross, satisfying the justice of God so as to redeem you. Redeem means to buy back. As we learn in the Catechism, you're not bought back with gold or silver, but with His holy, precious, and innocent blood. And we believe in the Holy Spirit sent by the Father and the Son to create and sustain faith in you, the Holy Spirit who sanctifies you and makes you holy. You know, just as that angel came and touched Isaiah's mouth with that live coal that he had taken from the altar, saying, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is purged. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is no more. So also, I mean, think of this. The angels who were there at that altar in Isaiah 6, they say, Holy, holy, holy. And in a few moments, you will walk up and the same words are right there at this altar altar and what you're given to receive from there is the living body and blood of Christ which is even more cleansing than that hot coal that touched Isaiah's lips by his body your sins are purged taken away and by his blood your sins are forgiven sure God in his infinite wisdom has seen fit to keep the glorious miracle of the Trinity a mystery but what He has revealed is all you need to know in order to be saved. Know that every day the Heavenly Father protects you and providentially provides for you. Every day your brother Jesus Christ, as we just sang, our elder brother, He stands with you. And every day the Holy Spirit, who loves you so, guides you into life and into love of God and the neighbor. And those three, that one triune God, will bring you home someday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand together. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord.